Well, good afternoon. This is uh, it's 12.31 on Monday, the 28th of August, 2017. That means it's a Monday afternoon, meaning we should be in, and we are in, Calculus 3. However, there's no one else in the room but me. A uh, student was here earlier, but he needed to also register for differential equations, so I took him down to the... <laughs> Registrar's office to see if he could, but and they are letting him do it, but he's having to fill out a drop ad form. So uh, hopefully he'll be in shortly. Um, but none of the other students are here, so that's a little bit discouraging, but I hope they will be getting here shortly. Okay, it is, uh, we are in section 12.2. We're just doing the first part of chapter 12, sort of PowerPoint slideshow. Uh, rather quickly. We're talking here about vectors in three dimensions and when you add a third dimension, when you're two dimensions you're on a plane and your horizontal axis is the, uh, we usually call the x-axis or the uh, independent variable and the y the vertical axis is the y-axis or the dependent variable. Pretty simple to do. But when you get to three dimensions then you have to sort of orient yourself a little bit better and more correctly and here's what you use the right hand rule and that's what this uh, figure here figure one is illustrating uh, what the right hand rule is okay um, if your x is uh, coming as you see here coming out of the page to the left uh, take your fingers of your right hand point in the direction of x bend them to the direction of y, positive y is coming out of the right hand side of the uh, board, um, and then your thumb is pointing in the positive z direction. If you had it reversed and x was coming out on the left and y was coming out on the right, positive x, positive y, then when you bend your fingers from x to y, your thumb is pointing downward, then your positive z axis would be down. Uh, so what they've drawn here would not be a right-handed system. That would be a left-handed system, which we don't do. We do right-handed systems. If you put the positive Z downward, then that would be correct. Okay, <clears throat> so that's the illustration of the right-hand rule. Now, <coughs> the second figure here shows, and there's a lot of text in between hand, um, in a three-dimensional system, rather than having a uh, set of ordered pairs, and here's Jasmine, we did add another student, I guess he added sometime last week, so uh, he uh, is down trying to get in differential equations also, and uh, he hasn't come back up yet, I don't know why, he knows where the class is. Uh, you're in differential equations too, aren't you? Um, there's Trace, huh? Just linear hands. Linear hands. Linear hands. You're in it. Okay. I have. Oh, I think it's Victor. Victor's the one that's in it. What's that? Where it is? Okay. Uh, let me pause this just a moment. That's what I was just waiting on was a program called Screencast-O-Matic. Not a very good program. It's a cheap program, and that's what the school pays for, yeah. unfortunately. Uh, but what it does, at the end of the class, uh, I will start the process of uploading it to YouTube. Uh -huh. So the first two classes, last week's classes, are already out there on YouTube. Okay. And so you can go back and listen to everything that we said in class uh, and the math that we did in class. Uh, so you can catch up everything we did. Then if you have any questions, come and ask. So I went over syllabus, I went over research paper instructions, I went over my locator card when I'm on campus, when I'm off campus, when I'm in class, when I'm not in class, when I'm at lunch, that kind of stuff. And then I also, uh, we, we talked about safety, you know, the various things that we would have to know to do in case of major events happen, oh, yeah. like okay. fire or weather or active shooter and that kind of stuff. So most of that you can hear and hopefully follow. Of course, when I walk down over there, 
you won't hear it because my microphone's in my computer here, and when I go and point something out on the back wall, you don't hear it as well. Hopefully you can hear something. Uh, but that's, and you can pick up everything we've done up to now. Okay. okay. And uh, because I taught Cal 2 in the summer, and we did have, we lost a week and a half out of 10 weeks class, so we lost 15% of the class. Uh, there was, uh, of course, Memorial Day was a Monday. Uh, the governor decided to give us the Monday before the 4th of July off, which wasn't scheduled. And also, I had a meeting that I had said I'd be willing to go to it if it was, we could go to the one in Atlanta on a Friday, Saturday. Yeah. That was, I thought, more convenient. I wouldn't miss classes, that type of thing. But it was a team of people. The vice president decided he wanted to do New Orleans on the Monday, Tuesday, and that lost another Monday. So we lost a week and a half, you know, three out of 20 classes, you know. And so we didn't get everything done. So what I was doing so far is catching up to where we need to start, actually, Cal 3, but giving you the background. So this stuff right here is stuff you'll be needing later, yeah. but you need to have it. So we're just doing a quick slideshow, basically, of it. All right, the rest of it you'll need to listen to. Then if you have questions, I'll try to expand on that some. All right, you don't have your book yet, or you do? Oh, what kind of book is it? It's a cal calculus book. Did uh, you take Cal 1 and Cal 2 I, here? Uh, I already said half that. Huh? Did you, say that? Did you take Cal 1 and Cal 2 here? Uh, no, sir. You took it where? That's UA? Okay, UA. Okay, what book did you use? Uh, do you uh, know? We used the uh, James Stewart. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I've taught from Stuart before, too. I don't know what edition I'll up to. Yeah, yeah. this one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's where we test and then it's going to be added. Um, basically, this is Cal 1, Cal 1, Cal 1, uh, Cal 1. Somewhere in here, you end Cal 1 and start Cal 2. Cal 2, Cal 2, Cal 3. I haven't gotten to no, Cal 2, Cal 2, Cal 2. Uh, and we went over some of this kind of stuff already, but we didn't get all that covered. Right now we're in this part here. Uh, that's oh, okay. No, the three-dimensional coordinates. Oh, it's right where we are already. Well, you already no, covered that. Yeah, I'm already covered that. So okay. pretty good. That's so okay. Good. We're going to finish. Just a quick review, like I said, a review of this, and this is where Cal 3 starts, project services. Okay. So we're just doing a review here because uh, those that were in the class in the summer uh, didn't get, uh, and that's right here in Cal 3 at the same time, mm -hmm. uh, we didn't get to go over this, so I'm going over it real quickly, and then we're going to pick up, and this is where the actual Cal 3 starts. I don't know who he is. Yeah. All right. But you see, we're we'll going to be doing vector calculus later, but you don't know vector what is in vector calculus. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. All right. Uh, continuing then. This is uh, figure two on page, uh, but you can use that book, and, you know, the calculus is the same. It's just how yeah. it's organized. Yeah. So some of the sections may be out of order, but, you know, from what this book does, but you can follow along with that. You don't need to get a new book. Yeah, okay. Um, so, when we're dealing with three dimensional system, uh, three dimensional vector space, you might say, uh, before in a two dimensional, we have quadrants one, two, three, and four. Now you have octants, and they don't really number these, but this is usually called the first octant, where x is positive, y is positive, and z is positive. Again, I talked about a little bit earlier about the right-hand rule. This is a right-hand system. This is called the first octant. All, and, and you represent any point in space, okay? Two-dimensional covers a plane, and any point in the plane you can find by those two coordinates. This covers space, and any point in space you can define by an ordered triplet. Not an ordered pair, but an ordered triplet. So let's just say our origin is this corner back here. There's our positive x-axis, 
positive y axis, right hand rule, x cross y gives you positive z up this way. So a point here might be one, two, three units positive on x, one, two, three, four, five units positive on y, and one, two, three, four, you know, maybe six positive units you know, up on z. Or out front of the building, in the fan room, yeah. downstairs, you could do anywhere in space. So this point right here would be positive A units on the x-axis, positive B units on the y-axis. So this point down here on the x-y plane would be AB normally, but since you're in three space, it would be AB zero. And then if you go up C units here, it's ABC would represent that point. Now, frankly, when I look at that, it looks like this is a weird uh, representation. Somehow to me, that looks longer than that, but in reality, I see it really isn't. These two lines don't really look like they're parallel to me, but they in reality are. But it's really hard to represent three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional board. You get a parallax problem. Okay, so that's what we mean, and this would be called the first octant, though we usually don't name the rest of them. Okay. Uh, on an axis, the coordinate, coordinate triplet would be A0, 0, 0, B0, 0, 0, 0 to C. In a plane, AB0, AB0, this would be uh, A0 to C up here. This would be 0, B, C up there. I think we've had a lot. Okay. Uh, all the vertices. Okay. Now, another thing you can look at are various planes in the three dimensional system. This would be the XY plane, and how you name the XY plane is Z is equal to zero. Because everywhere in that plane, Z is equal to zero, that defines a plane. This plane is defined when y is equal to zero. Any value for x, positive or negative. Any value for y, z, positive or negative. Z if y is equal to zero, that would define the xz plane. The yz plane would be defined where x is equal to zero. Any value at y, positive or negative. Any value z, positive or negative. That would be x equal to zero defines the xz plane. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. More questions. Yeah, sure. So, since this is a three day, uh, um, three D plane, right? So, will this represent this what? R three, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and it was like that's a two D plane. Is it R two? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what that means is real number system in three dimensions. Real, real number system, system in two dimensions. Okay. That's why R is used there. Here, I've got an eraser here. Yeah. Okay. You leave it up too long, it dries on the board. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and the very next statement is, as in two dimension, we derive the distance formula in R3, the three-dimensional system. Here's the distance formula. And it looks very much like it did in R2, or two-dimensional XY plane. Only now you have three dimensions. Uh, distance would be uh, the distance. And, and this book uses single bars that look like absolute values. Some texts will do a double bar, meaning a uh, magnitude. Okay? Distance, magnitude means about the same thing. This book uses single bars. It says P minus Q. That's the point whose end point is P, the initial point is Q distance uh, of that line segment from P, Q to P between points P, A1, B1, C1, and A2, B2, C2. Actually, the way they describe that was like going from P to Q. doesn't matter which one because you've got the distance there. Yeah. That length of that would be the square root of A2 minus A1 squared plus B2 minus B1 squared plus C2 minus C2. C1 squared, square root of the sum of those squares. That's the defining distance. Notice 
distance, magnitude, always positive quantities. Always. Okay? That was a vector, it could be positive, it doesn't matter. This is a magnitude or a distance, and that would be always positive. So this is a principal square root. This is a number, you square it, it's going to be positive. Whether a1 is greater than a2 or, or not, this may be positive or negative, but when you square it, it becomes positive. Add to that another positive number, add to that another positive number, and you've got a positive number, you're taking the square root off, you're going to have a positive number. The principal square root. Okay, so that's distance formula in R3. Okay, and they do a little proof with it here. Um, in some way similar to the proof probably in R2, but if you're talking about, I could have done better positioning that, but if this is your point Q, P, A1, B1, C1, here's your point Q, A2, B2, B, C2, then the magnitude of that length from the, here to there, what they did is draw them a parallelogram. You do, uh, they didn't, well, I don't know where you put it, but uh, if this is A1 units out here, A2 units on the x axis is here, B1 is here, wherever your origin is, B2 is here, uh, and then C1 would be wherever your origin is, plus or minus whatever that C1 happens to be. Um, up or down here. Uh, in this plane, where z is equal to c1, all the values z were c1, but you would want here. So the length of this, since you're at r, this displacing any on c, the only displacement is between a1 and b1. So this would be the square root of a2 minus a1 squared plus b2 minus b1 squared. That would be the length of that. Okay. Now you displace it upwards from C1 to C2, but leave the A's and B's the same. So this length is merely C1 minus C2. And then the distance between this one, which is the square root of, like I just said, A2 minus A1 squared plus B2 minus B1 squared. Uh, and then this distance is the square root of C2 minus C1 squared. And the square root of that would be the, the distance that is. That's how you would compute it. And that's sort of what the next slide, next side of this slide shows, is you know, when you take this length, which is already described, plus that length, which is just that, and the square root of this square plus that square plus that square, and take the square root of it, you got exactly what you would have. That's sort of a geometric proof of it, uh, but that does give you exactly that formula. Yeah. yeah. What, um, what happened is, like, can you start visual to the left a little bit? Say that again. So Move it back. Yes, uh, you see how it says P minus Q? Well, yeah. I, I wasn't given that, but I was told to find the distance between P and Q. That's well, what this represents, right? It, it represents the triangle. So what happens, like, I saw that picture and I need to find the distance between Q and P or P and Q. No matter how, like, what I'm just trying to say is, how you how you know you're supposed to set it up to where it needs to be? It's like, why am I just end up being Q first minus P? Okay. It, it, it doesn't matter because of these bars here. This is magnitude. Oh, oh yeah. So that doesn't right. really matter. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah. It, looking at this, I would think this is the square root of A1 minus a2 squared plus b2 1 minus b2 squared plus c1 minus c2 squared. But guess what? You know, mm -hmm. you're taking a difference in the square. One way it's going to be a positive number, you square it. Other way it's going to be a negative number, you square it. It's going to be the same power. Yeah, right. So it doesn't matter. So as long as the bars are there. If it said p minus q, sure enough, um, frankly, if it said that, I would think P was the final and Q was the initial. But with the absolute value bars, it doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Okay? Yeah. Does that answer? Yeah, it yeah. is. All right. Now, here is a good old sphere, okay? Tetanus 
gracious, such a pain in the neck. The uh, slides for this text are just pathetic, and yeah, you have to blow them up so they're readable from, from any distance away. Here's a sphere of radius r centered at the point A, B, C. Wherever your origin is, wherever that is, here's the center of that sphere, A, B, C. Now notice the sphere does not go through A, B, C at all. That's the center of it. The sphere is all around it, but doesn't ever go through A, B, C. It's just the center. And that's a radius capital R. Then this defines a locus or a set of points, X, Y, Z, as long as that distance is equal to R. Okay? Now, that what defines a, uh, a sphere. All the points on the sphere are equal distance from the center of the sphere. That's what defines the sphere. So if you wanted to express that mathematically, that would be the square root of x minus a squared plus y minus b squared plus c minus z squared is equal to r. Or, x minus a squared plus y minus b squared plus z minus c squared is equal to r squared. You can write it that way too. Or, using the distance formula, the square root of that, and then it's the r. And that indeed is the three-dimensional rectangular coordinate system uh, equation for a sphere. Okay? In two dimensions, it would be this, that would then not be a sphere, but a circle. X minus A, circle whose center is AB, X minus A squared minus plus B, Y minus B squared is equal to R squared. That would be a circle centered at AB, radius R. Okay? Now, three dimensional. Now we add a Z minus C squared, and now you have a sphere centered at the point ABC or triplet ABC uh, with a equal with a radius R. All right, so there's the circle. Uh, jumping right along here, here is another equation. Okay, an equation of a sphere radius a sphere in R three. Now, <laughs> yeah. this capital R is parameter, meaning a real number, three-dimensional re real number. This R is your radius of that particular sphere. It has nothing to do with that capital R at all. So, well, I wish they'd do something else, but uh, like a little R would do just as well, it seemed like to me. Centered at some point Q, A, B, C, order triplet, a single point in free space. Then this would be like I just said, and I'm not doing the square root form here, this is the square form. X minus A squared plus Y minus B squared plus C minus Z minus C squared is equal to R squared. That would give you your equation of the sphere. Now, a right circular cylinder, think of a tin can, okay? Right circular cylinder in R3 of radius of capital R, again, this R and that R, no connection with each other whose central axis is the vertical line through AB0. In other words, uh, it's your z-axis, okay? Your z-axis, okay? Because A would be here, Z would be, uh, B would be here, so it's up here, but then you have a vertical axis parallel to the z-axis uh, in, in free space. So this, uh, then your base of that would be a circle, x minus a squared plus y minus b squared is equal to r squared. Now this is a right circular cylinder whose radius of the base is capital R. That's one I certainly call a little r, just because we're used to seeing that. Um, and then that would be any value z you put in there, always the, the x's and y would always have the same relation. Anywhere you, whatever value z you put in, z is equal to c, you have x minus a squared plus y minus b squared is equal to r squared. So that's a tin can or 
right circular cylinder. Okay? Now, there is an example given here, and this is approximately the picture of it. It looks a little different. Um, no, no, I'm sorry. This is exactly the picture that's given in the left-hand margin on page 670, 637, if you have this text. Uh, that would be the right circular cylinder we just described. Uh, for any A, B, center A, B, zero. So you're not going up or down from the Z axis to A, B on the A on the X, B on the Y, and then zero on the C. That circle there, center of that, would have radius half of R. Uh, so if you just say X minus A squared plus Y minus B squared is equal to R squared, that's going to be a right circular cylinder. No matter what value C you put in there, A and B are related by that way, and they'll all go always in the same way. Okay. So that's a right circular cylinder in three space, R3. All right. Again, I'm not working examples here because this is just sort of a review to catch up, up where we need to be. This is a hemisphere, okay, in three space. Now the, the axis of this hemisphere is the y-axis, not the x or the z like we were doing before, but the y-axis. Okay, this has a radius of 2, so this would be... Um, X squared, and, and by the way, the center is the origin, so the, the A, B, and C is all zero here. So this would be X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared is equal to 4. 2 squared, that's the rate of squared. Okay, but given that Y is greater than or equal to 1. So you have the, top, the back half of that sphere, this would have to point out in one direction. Okay. Here is a, an upper cylinder, they call it. It has a fixed base down here, but it spins indefinitely upward. Well, up, at a fixed base up here, and it spins down, but that would be a downward cylinder. Okay? It's the upper cylinder, and its base is, uh, the center of the base is a 3, 2, minus 1. So from positive 3, positive 2, and then go down 1, that is the circular base there, and go up here. So what would that be? That would be x minus 3 squared, oh, and by the way, this has radius 1, okay? So x minus 3 squared plus y minus 2 squared. Um, and you don't have to write anything for z yet, is equal to 1. 1 squared is 1, but then you write c greater than or equal to 1. Okay. That would be only from c is equal to minus 1 and upward. So just a couple of more. This is, yeah. Because like for a second, I was getting a score, I think, for the cubes, but the drawing is kind of confusing me a little bit. Yeah. So you're saying that in the x, y plane, the z-axis is actually going up 100, down one unit, correct? Yeah. If, if this were centered at this point right here, it would be 3, zero, three 2, 0. Okay? And that would be, if it started here, it went up from there. But this one's going down one from here. And this down one is this one. This one here is just a radius. Yeah. Yeah. So there are two different ones, but yeah. It's just dropped down. That looks like a big one. Uh, that looks like one here, and that looks like one. That looks pretty reasonable there. It doesn't look like that would be true. But again, you're at three space. It's hard to get your dimensions to make sense. Uh, what it looks like to me, this value for two is much, much different from that value for three. So it looks like they've got it labeled poorly, but that's how they chose label. The x-axis is foreshortened a little bit, and the y-axis is not. Z-axis doesn't seem to be much either. 
Okay. So it's very difficult to draw dimensionally correct figures of three space on a two dimensional piece of paper or board. It's really tough to do. Okay. All right. Now, you flip a page here to go to, here's a, what they're calling vector concepts. Okay. As in a plane, a vector V, and the book only labels vectors according to uh, cap, uh, bold letters. Okay. I can't write bold, so I put an arrow over mine. Or the book does do this if you've got a PQ. P always refers to the initial point, Q always refers to the ter terminal point. So you see the, you can picture the initial point here, the arrow here, then you have the terminal point, Q. So that's the reference of that. Um, and again, <laughs> To get the dimensions right, a sort of nuts here. Um, here we three, three, two, three units on x, three units on y, two units up. So there would be the vector, the, the, the point three, three, two. Points, by the way, with parentheses around the ordered pairs, ordered triplets, order inputs, or whatever it is. Now q is coming out of the board. It's not going that way on the board, it's coming out of the board. And you've got five units on X, seven units on Y, and four units up. So that's out here somewhere. But that's the best way they can represent two space. Um, frankly, this looks like it's about the same length as that, which was two. It's not, it's a lot longer than that. It's the square root of 5 minus 3, that would be 2 squared. 7 minus 3 would be 4 squared. And 4 minus 2 would be 2 squared again. That's a lot longer than 2 units by, by all means. Okay. So it's, you can't ever get the dimensions so they're perfect there. Okay. So there is a vector going from P to point Q. Okay, what would be the magnitude of that vector? Now here they do use the double lines and that would be just what I just basically verbalized there. The square root of five minus three squared plus seven minus three squared plus four minus two squared. So that would be four plus 16 plus four, that's 24 through 24 would be a pretty reasonable number, almost five units. That vector here is almost five units long. Okay. And that doesn't look anywhere close to these five units here. Well, actually, it doesn't look too far from that, does it? Yeah, I think it is. Um, but it's not in the same direction. Okay. All right, with that in mind, let's look at some other features of vectors. In three space. Very similar to what we said before. If this is some vector V in three space, okay? Again, they write vectors as bold, generally lowercase English letters, script letters, okay? But you can express this vector in another way. Now, this is the first time they did it in this section. Angle bracket here. How you tell a point ABC from a vector ABC, a point is enclosed by parentheses, a vector is enclosed by angle brackets. These are coordinates of the point, A units, B units, C units, okay? These are components of a vector. Same A unit uh, in the X direction, B units in the Y direction, and C units is there. The vector represented by this uh, A 
units here, B units there, C units here. This vector represents this vector here too, but this one is not located at the origin, initial position at the origin. This initial position is out here at P and ending at Q. But again, the components are just from P to Q, um, A units in one direction, let's just Let's just imagine it. A units here, B units there, and C units up. That would give you this vector, which is exactly the same dimensionally as V0, which is from the origin of Q0, that point A, B, C. So vector V and its translate. Now this book calls it a translate, and most of the time I don't see that term. The word translate is normally be a verb. This book uses it as a, as a noun. Translate base at the origin. Here's that vector base at the origin. Here's the base at P and U. Same magnitude, same direction, same vector, or equivalent vector, but just like we did in two dimensional. I think last time we met, didn't we go over that? Okay. Now. When you're adding in three space, just like the parallelogram law we had before, but much easier to do the parallelogram law is adding components. Okay? If this is vector v, and this is in standard position from the origin, vector w in standard position from the origin, then v plus w would be v plus w, and this would be vector v plus w, or w plus v. And that would give you V plus W. That's why the parallelogram law, if you're using adding by components, you just write down what V is, A, B, C, what W is, D, E, F, okay? And then the vector V plus W would be A plus D, comma, D plus E, comma, C plus L. Whatever it was. Yeah. Hey, can it? What's that? Can it come out of um, a style or a vector component? Can it come out of what? It comes out of a vector component. Yeah, okay. yeah. The okay. style of two vectors is always a vector. You're absolutely right. Uh, and vector addition is close on, on a vector space. You're, you're absolutely right. It's in the same plane as both of those vectors. Okay. Now, here's a few characteristics or properties of vectors in three space. And basically, in any space, in here's vector. Uh, ve vector, since we're talking about vectors, okay, something like that. Being camera knowledge, or, yeah, that kind of All right. We just added Treddy to the class today, so last week, end of the week. If you multiply a vector v by a scalar number lambda, whatever that happens to be, then that would be lambda times a vector a1, b1, c1. This is the vector in three space. And that would simply be the vector lambda a1, comma lambda b1, comma lambda c1. It just takes that vector v, whichever way it's heading, and scales it upward by a factor of lambda. So that's scaling each of the components upward by a factor of lambda. Okay? Now, if you're adding two vectors in free space, you add vector A, A1, B1, C1, plus vector W, A2, B2, C2, you just add them by components. First component, A1 plus A2, comma, B1 plus B2, comma, C1 plus C2, comma, close vector, vector to vector. Much easier to do that way than trying to draw the parallelogram rule in free space, which you can't get your dimensions to look like anyway. Okay? Adding them by components, way to go, the way to go. Multiplying by a scalar, the way to go too. Okay. Um,
Now, they sort of skipped over example two that didn't show a picture of it, but you can read through that if you'd like. Uh, the standard basis vectors, there are several of them, but the standard basis vectors in three space, R3, sorry, my eyes are very dry and itchy, I can hardly focus on them right now. There's a lot happened, there's a bunch. These are the I, J, and K vectors, the unit vectors in the X direction, I, and the vector in the Y direction, K, uh, J, and the unit vector in the Z direction, K. Now, what do we mean by unit vectors? Magnitude of one, magnitude of one, magnitude of one. Directions along the axis, but magnitude of one. Okay? Now, if you have some vector coming out from the origin here, its components, if you wrote it in component notation, this is another form of component notation, this is using the unit vectors. Uh, rectangular vectors, i, j, k. You would be a, i, so whatever the i, a, the unit vector is here, multiply that by i, that looks like approximately three here, multiply this j by its, which looks like approximately four, and multiply its k by two and a half, three and a half, something like that, whatever its uh, distance is there. So you can represent this vector V as the component A, I, plus B, J, plus C, K. Whatever the unit vector is in each dimension, each direction. Generally, we want them to be the same magnitude, but it doesn't have to be, but most of the time it is. So you can write this vector. Why did I blow that up? Sorry. I'm having such trouble getting my fingers small enough. Okay, so another way to write vector V, which has components A, B, C in vector notation, component notation. This is another form of component notation, A, I plus B, J plus C, J, K. Plus I, J, and K are the unit vectors in the direction of the X, Y, and Z axis. All right, and this sort of shows it as we did before. This is uh, a times I, uh, here's your unit vector, A units this way, so it'd be one unit, two unit, three units maybe. Um, this would be one unit, J, two, three, and maybe four. And simple. Well, let me forget, is that some unit vector K? That would be two, three, maybe three. C value. Okay. Does that make sense? Pretty straightforward, I think, I hope. All right. Now, parametric equations. Goodness, my eye itches. Part of it is looking. I realize that this happens in the afternoon. I think part of it is the fact that half the time I'm facing so the glare of the wind is coming in, the other half the time I'm facing so the reflection from the board is coming in. I think that drives, sort of drives my eyes crazy. Didn't have this problem this morning. So if it does now, I'll see, I'll see if the reflection of the wind is working out. I'm just getting too much sensory overload on the eyes, I guess. So, what if you have a line through the origin? Okay. If you have a vector v and you want a line that's along that direction v, then r of zero, which is how you would represent this, as a function of t would be t times v. Because if it's a line through the origin, v's through the origin, and it's on the same path, it's got to be some multiple of v, okay? So it'd be one v, two v. That's about two v. So it'd be some multiple of v. Two v's become one v. 
1.93b or whatever it happens to be, that would be this value R0 in that direction. Going through the RF. Now, what if you're talking about a line that doesn't go through the origin, but is parallel to this vector v? The parallel to it means that it has the same direction to it, okay? It's just that it's had a translation somehow. Uh, and let's say that you're moving from the origin, point zero, to some terminal value, P0. Okay. Now, this is the blue line here is in the direction of V. The green line here is parallel to the blue line, meaning it has it precisely the same direction, uh, but possibly the same or different magnitudes. That doesn't matter. But it is offset from what your original was. Okay? Then the eyes hurt. Yes, it's the water. Okay. So you would take the vector OP, add it to the vector PV, that would be this vector. So this added to that, take this vector and see tail, head to tail on it, from here to there, same direction, same magnitude. Then you're adding those two together, and this will give you your line P. Now, OP just offsets it from the origin. OP0 is your offset initial point. Sort of like that's where the origin is translating to. But then your line goes infinitely in both directions. It goes down here and it goes up here. That's your line. I guess that's a capital lambda. I don't remember what capital lambda looked like, but that's the closest I can pick up now. Uh, OP plus P times V gives you your line number. So there's a way to express a line in the direction of a given vector V offset to some point P0 from the origin. Okay. Now how does that typically look? Um, before we go any further, you know, typically we say V is the vector of the component A, B, C, so it'd be P, I plus P, J plus um, P, uh, go back to what else named that. Did they name it A, B, C, or what did they name it? Just some T. Here's your vector V, T times V. And if this was ABC, then this would be PA times PBC times plus PC. Add that to OP, OP0, uh, then you've got letters here. P0 normally would name those ABC, but we've already used that. So let's call it DEF. Okay, this is P0 here. We have coordinates. This is a point. A point has coordinates in parentheses. D0, E0, F0. Those are the coordinates of that point right there. So what you do is take your uh, representative vector, which would be PV, and add it to that point there. And that basically gives you your parametric equations for that line, lambda or L or whatever you're calling it. Okay. So what I've been blah blah blahing saying, here they actually write it down in a pretty good and memorable location. Okay. 
So equation of the line, and that would be a point direction point. So the line L, or lambda, whatever that symbol is, through the point P0, which we're going to call X0, Y0, Z0, just to give it a name, a particular point through there, in the direction of this vector B, which is components, that's coordinates, this is components, A, B, C is described by Here's the vector parameterization, okay? Vector parameterization. Sometimes I put an extra syllable in there called the big parameter, but this is parameterization, parameterization. Okay. So this point OP is basically going to have coordinates. The vector OP is going to have vector coordinates x0, y0, z0, okay? Plus TV, TV we've already said was T times A plus C times, I mean, not plus, comma, TV, comma, TC, okay? So that would be the uh, vector, the terminal point of every point on that line, the terminal point of that vector would describe any point on that line. For any value T you have to the parametric equation would then be just each parameter. The x coordinate would be x0 plus ta, y coordinate would be y0 plus tb, as you see for tb, bt, the other side, z0 plus tc. They call it cp. And that parameter uh, t can vary from negative infinity to positive infinity. A very large negative number would be way down there somewhere, a very large positive number would be way there somewhere. Okay. These two represent the same line. You can almost see that from vector notation. The x coordinate um, would be this plus T A this plus T C Okay. All right, here is sort of a vector visualization of that same concept. All right. When R, I hate to do this because I have to. Notice here we let that parameter be a T, okay? And we weren't requiring it to be anything special, to be anything it wanted to, okay? Uh, try to think of a dumb example, but I don't think it's necessary here. Okay. That's back. These are the various R vectors. The gold vectors here are these R vectors. R at zero, when T is equal to zero, zero times, uh, and, and by the way, here your T is two, okay? Uh, two times two, so that's your, that's your Your direct V is your direction vector, and, and you're starting with the 2V. You could have started with V. There's 3V there. Looks like you're starting with 3V. Okay. And your offset point was this point right here. Okay. And they called it X0, Y0, Z0, which would have been fine. Okay. So any point on that line represents some vector. R, R of T, of T doesn't always have to be time, but quite often it is. Here's time T is equal to negative 1, T is equal to 0, T is equal to 1, T is 3. It could be times, it could be other things, but um, we were able to do those. 
traces out a line uh, as t varies from negative to infinity to positive infinity. So negative to infinity is going this way, positive to infinity is going that way. Okay, these are values that are plotted here. And you see R uh, of zero would be just that um, that would be zero P. Okay. There's no no new vector out there. But uh, then R is say twice that twice that would be explained geology. Uh, this would be your R vector then. And T is equal to 1. Here's your R vector and T is equal to 2. R vector and T is equal to 3. R vector and T is equal to minus 1. Okay? And you keep going back from there. Um, now, something they show here, which I don't find all that useful, but I mean, you can. If this is vector v, this is vector minus v. So if one of these had a minus sign on it, you flip around and flip it down this way. And, uh, that would give you the other side of this, would be a negative number. So the terminal point of R of t traces that line from negative infinity to positive infinity. And they only showed the integral values. Any fractional value in between that would be, say, a value between 0 and 1 would be somewhere on that line, green line between 0 and 1, terminal point. Okay. Yuck. What did it just do? I don't know why it keeps going off. Okay. All right, I don't want this. Well, that view's okay. It just changed views on me is what it did. This is a whole nother set of, okay. I don't think I can write on this now. Let's see if I can. Oh, I have to get my color back. Okay. I guess I can. It's going to be, can I blow this up? Let's zoom in. It's just like before. Now can I draw on that? And it shrinks back. Okay, I thought it would. It's a pain in the neck. Okay. All right. Either this is an example, which I'm guessing it is. Yes, it is. This is example four. Find the vector parameterization and parametric equations for the line through the point uh, 3, 1, negative 4. That's a different problem. Okay. Either of the books, I guess that's the case. Okay, now my cursor is not showing up, which is sort of a pain in the neck. Okay. Not the same one in the book. Okay. Oh. Nope. I 
not see any of these being the same one. Okay. gotten out of this mode before. I just can't remember. High presenter view, that's it. There we go. Alright, that's the one we just had. Okay. Since we're not doing the examples, I'm not going to worry about this. Uh, this is probably from the earlier edition. Okay. If we're doing the same one we are here, and it's not the same one, this is your point, P0. In your text, it's 3, negative 1, 4. Here, it's negative 3, 3, 6. It's just a point. I mean, it's given as a vector, uh, but it's P0, so it meaning it's coming from the origin. So these are the components of the vector coming from the origin. Plus T times, and in your text it's 217. In the old slides it was 4, negative 3, negative 6. Um, so it says give the vec vector parameterization. That would be the R1, would be that. Now this is just picking a single point. And this would be, say, when T is equal to 1 t is equal to 1, you would have the point 4 minus 3 is 1, uh, negative 2 plus 3 would be 1, and negative 6 plus 6 would be 0. That would be one particular value when t is equal to 1. That may be why the new addition is doing that same thing. Uh, it's talking about the vector r when that would be, well, let's make this not the best way to do it. But make this the vector r, okay, of t. And this would be your p0, that's a p0, plus t times your vector v. There's your vector v. Um, and if you did that, the components of this vector r t would then be negative 3 plus 4t, comma, 3, minus 2t, comma, 6, minus 6t, comma. That would be the vector rep, uh, representation of that vector, and that would be the vector parameterization would be that. If you were doing the parametric equations, then you merely say x is equal to minus 3 plus 4t, comma, 3 minus 2t, I mean, I'm sorry, I was doing the same thing again, y would equal 3 minus 2t, z is equal to 6 minus 6t, okay, that would be your parametric equations for each parameter. Right. Now, what if they gave you two points and said come up with the vector parameterization or the uh, parameter equations for those two points? Let's see if the next example says that. Yes. Okay. Let's see if this is the same one. Just is so hard to read. I'm going to blow it up even though I can't write on that. Okay. No, not quite the same again. Uh, they gave uh, fine parameters through these two points uh, 1, 0, 2, and 2, 5, negative 1. Uh, it's 
not the same equation. Okay. What would be the direction vector? Okay. Let me do, well, I wasn't going to do the ones in the book. I think they're fairly straightforward. So you just look at the ones in the book. I'm sorry they aren't matching the slides and go with that. Uh, this is nowhere. Ah, this is example seven. Ah, that's what this one is. This is the intersection of two lines. So they don't do five or six, okay? Parametric e equations in line through two points. They don't do that one or the different parameterization of the same line. They don't do that one. But, let me see if maybe they didn't. Ha! That's what... That was part of... This one was part of example 6. I was trying to make it fit example 5. It's not. Or, yeah. Uh, that was example 6. They didn't have an example 5. Okay. That was what the problem is. That was example six. Basically, different parameterizations of the same line. Okay. No, that's not what I want to do. All right. That's what this is. Two lines, one, one, zero, plus T times minus two, three, one, and the second one is R2 of T is negative 3, 3, 6 plus T times 4, negative 2, 1. That actually, hmm. it says show that those two equations parameterize the same line and and this is what the result is and that is the line okay all right and that's then the parametric equations you get to this one on the other hand is intersection of two lines Okay, sorry about that. Okay, here's a line. 1, 0, 1 plus T1, 3, 3, 5. Second line is 3, 6, 1 plus T2, 4, negative 2, 7. Okay, and it said find the intersection of 2. Well, the intersection of 2 would be the point where those two are the same. So that would be 1 plus 3, T1 is equal to 3 plus 4t2. There's an equation. Well, we don't have to shrink it if we're going to write that. 1 plus 3t1 has to equal 3 plus 4t2. Okay? Second equation would be 0. Well, let's just... You don't have to write 0. It doesn't mean anything, so leave it off. This will be... 3t1 is equal to 6 minus 2 t2. Alright, now that looks like a fairly easy equation to deal with. And again, what you're doing is 0 plus 3t1 is equal to 6, so it's a component by component minus 2t2, okay? So you can find out exactly what t1 is here. Uh, t1 is equal to 2, you divide everything by this, minus 2 thirds t2, okay? All right. Uh, and your third equation would be 1 plus 5t1 is equal to 1 plus 7t2. 
how you could plug this value T1 in here and um, what's that? And yeah, it's also T2. Uh, and, and that would then give you what T2 is. Uh, and then plug back in and, uh, and get what T1 is. Well, once you get T2, then you just plug in this and this is T1. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, in that fact, you could plug it in either place. Actually, it looks like the numbers might be a little simpler here. To plug in this one here and see what you get. I'm not sure they're a lot easier, but a little bit. And uh, uh, and the other thing you can interject here, this is your x value, this is your y value, and this is your z value, okay? So you actually can, can plug that in too. And yeah, let's, I wasn't going to do it, but it's, it's fairly simple to do. Um, so x is equal to 1 plus 6. minus 2t2 multiplying 3 times t1 okay and that's equal to 3 plus 4t2 I'll group all the t2s together that gives you 6t2 when you add this to both sides And let's subtract 3 from both sides. This is a 5. Uh, that's equal to 2, it looks like. Okay. So that means T2 is equal to 1 third. And plug that in here. T1 is equal to 2 minus 2 thirds times one-third, so that would be two minus two-ninths, which would be 18 ninths, that would be 16 ninths, okay? All right, now, got three equations, two unknowns. This is what those two give you here. Let's plug these two values in here and see if you get the same thing. 1 plus 5 times 16 ninths be 80 ninths. I'm doing 5 times 16 in my head. I think that's right, isn't it? No. 75 ninths. No. Where's my brain now? Okay. All right, 5 times T1. T1, we said, was 16 ninths. 5 times 16 is 80, okay, ninths. So this will be 9 ninths plus, so that will be 89 ninths. Supposedly, is that equal to 1 plus 7 times, where's my T2? Yeah, 7 thirds. I'm guessing not. This will be 3 thirds, that would be 10 thirds. Is 81 ninths 10 thirds? No, it's not. 90 ninths would be 10 thirds, but 80, no, it wouldn't. Uh, so guess what? These two do not have any points of intersection. That's what that tells you. It's sort of a tricky problem. You do not get the same thing. And by the way, it's supposed to be 14 nights. How did I get 18 minus? Well, 
Well, they got two-thirds, not one-third. Huh. All right, let's see if I did this right. The y value was 0, 3t1 is equal to 6 minus 2t2. Yeah, divide both sides by 3, and you get that. 2 minus 2 thirds t2. That's what t1 is equal to. Okay, then plug that into the first equation, 1 plus 6 minus 2t2 is equal to, oh, goodness gracious. That's a 6 there, isn't it? Okay. Let's start back here. We're supposed to be plugging in here. I'm getting so confused here. Let's, let, let me, all right. Okay. I'm going to start these over because it seems like, I came out close, but it seems like I was off by a factor of two, and it's probably from the same error. So let's make sure we get that done correctly. I wasn't going to do it now. Let's see, let's erase this one too. All right. Let's just check our work and see if we got it right. 1 plus 3t1 is equal to 3 plus 4t2. Got it. The y one is 3t1 is equal to 6 minus 4t, 2t2. Got it. And let's divide everything by 3, and that's what you get. The Z one, I'm going to write it down here so it's less problematic. I think I had it right, but I'm going to write it down here. 1 plus 5T1 is equal to 1 plus 7T2. Okay. Now, if I take this value and plug it in here, that will give me 1 plus 6 minus 2t2. No, that's where I made the mistake before. Okay. All right, let's start over again. 1 plus 6 minus, oh, that was right, 1 plus 6 minus 2t2, yeah, that was okay, is equal to, that's plugging that in, this is where I messed up, 3 plus 4t2. I should have been plugging into this one. So this would be 7 minus 2t2 is equal to 3 plus 4t2, okay? Add 2t2 to both sides and subtract 3 from both sides, and that gives me 4 is equal to 6t2, yeah. So t2 is equal to 2 thirds. That's what I should have had. I had T2 is equal to one-third. And then when you plug that in here, you get T1 is equal to 2 minus 4 ninths. Okay. Which would be 18 ninths minus 4 ninths would be 14 ninths. Yeah. That's what you had in the book. 
yeah. Okay. So, exactly. Now you plug that into the third one. 1 plus 5 times T1, which would be 5 times 14 ninths. Supposedly, that should be equal to 1 plus 7 times 2 thirds. All right. This would be 1 plus 14 times 5 would be 7, 70 ninths. Is that equal to 1 plus 14 thirds? And the answer is probably no. This would be 79 ninths. Is that equal to... I don't know why I've got an extra line through that. Um, 3 thirds plus that would be 17 thirds. And the answer is no. If you multiply 3 times that, you get 9. 3 times that, you get 51. So no, they do not equal. Therefore, there is no intersection. Okay? Now, why did they give you one like that to begin with? I don't know. But that means one line's going like this, the other's going like this. They never cross. There is no point of intersection. That's what your picture here in the text, even though it's not showing you, here. They are not crossing there. This one's going underneath that. Okay. So there is no point of intersection. Okay. Boy, that was longer than it should have been. Okay. And we go to 155, which is now 155, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the lines R1 and R2 do not intersect. But the particular points, R1 of T1 and R2 of T2, do have the same X, Y coordinates. They just don't have the same Z coordinates. So you see, that's what we were coming up with. All right. Why is this doing that? Well, because I'm hitting the wrong keys. All right. Here's where we'll start off next time. I don't even see this. I do not see that figure anywhere here. That must have been from the previous edition. They're not showing that here, so don't sweat that. A line through two points. Ha! All right, this is more like example five, the one that we did not find before. That's given here, and they're not showing it here at all, so uh, don't sweat that. Right-hand rule again, uh, sphere and cylinder, we've seen that before. Okay, that finished 12.2. We'll start next time with 12.3, dot products. Okay, we'll do these, I uh, hope to be a little bit quicker than we were this time. So we'll begin there this time. Good deal. And by the way, any of these odd number homework problems, any of these you want to do to make sure you understand, we're actually start testing on 12.6, not on this preliminary stuff. So I'll try to move it along a little faster. One, making one dumb mistake really threw me off there. And now... It's not allowing me to exit this. Okay. Go and end that.